in uh, giving uh, lectures in Washington, D.C. because to name some of them is libelous. No, anyway, that's, leave that where it is. Uh, in any case, uh, so you can hold for a moment here while I get myself together. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, uh, this challenge to create oneself is a magnificent one, and uh, it, it bears, as I say, striking resemblance to artistic creation. However, the level of self-consciousness involved is perhaps even greater, because when you create a fictional character like Hamlet, the artist can, as it were, distance himself from that creation to a certain extent, and always has the alibi of saying, like actresses and actors do, well, I just created that part. Jodie Foster talking about playing a prostitute when she was 12. Well, I just created that part. Well, I bet she did. She probably didn't have. But in any case, an artist can always distance themselves from their work. But if you're Nietzsche's very special kind of artist, and your work is yourself, your own subjectivity, then the split and the distance is much more intimate and narrow, and the creation is your own self-creation, then the challenge is extremely risky. Because if you write a character in a novel or a play and you don't like the character, you can edit it. But if you write a character for yourself in an ongoing way, you can't just simply edit it out because it is you, your subjectivity, that's at issue. So for these and a host of other reasons, I think that Nietzsche's uh, uh, challenge concerning the eternal recurrence uh, is a fascinating one. Another uh, motto that grows out of this notion of the eternal recurrence is Nietzsche's motto that he was in love with fate, or loved fate, the love of fate. Because for Nietzsche, there is something also fateful about where you find yourself. You know, I, I, I mean, Nietzsche believed that you find yourself, as a matter of fact, growing up in certain communities with certain you know, linguistic possibilities, historical possibilities, social possibilities, and so on, about which you have no choice. You know, Heidegger's sort of yucky way of saying this is that you're sort of thrown into the world. Uh, another way to put the same point is, if you've ever seen this uh, game Class Struggle, a Marxist dice game, you begin by rolling the genetic dice, okay? The high roll, if you roll high, you get, well, first of all, the order in which you roll helps to tell you, you know, something. Uh, you, you begin rolling with the whitest male rolling first, on down to the darker males, and then you go down, and the last person to roll will be the darkest female in the room as you roll the genetic dice. And then they tell you what class you're born into. And so the throw of the dice, so you may go, well, that's a silly. No, I mean, it's, it's the throw of the genetic dice does put you in certain positions and conditions of life to begin with that you did not choose. And for Nietzsche, that's a threat and an opportunity, both. The flip side of that crisis is an opportunity. And that's that whatever your condition, this kind of act of self-creation can be undertaken, and in fact, sometimes spectacularly so, when you're thrown into the worst conditions. And I can't help but bring up now my favorite politician in the United States today. And so I can do it in this time in a flattering example, and I'm sure many of you don't like this politician. He's a local po politician, and that's Jesse Jackson. And I, 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 I think Jesse Jackson is in many ways an exemplary human being, and in this strong sense, that coming from where he came and to engage in that act of self-creation, which the media now goes, oh, well, you know, he puts on a mask, he plays a part. Well, how long have they been around here, you know? I mean, how long have they been around the United States? I mean, is that supposed to surprise anybody? No, it's that, it's the quality uh, of the performance. It's how intimately it's knitted in with self and against what obstacles that's given it its drama. And of course, the, the, the current sort of derision about that self-creation of Jackson, that ongoing process, the derision about it now uh, doesn't surprise me historically because I was around when Martin Luther King was derided, made fun of, 
Of course, the moment that he was dead and the myth could be closed off, he was safely blanched out into the general culture where now he becomes a, a figure for McDonald's advertising and the picture of Martin Luther King, you know, at one time the, the, the sort of communist, dangerous, bizarre, scary civil rights leader. It's hard to even go back there in history after all this work of social amnesia that has been performed upon us. But now that he's blanched out, safe, secure, in short, dead, then the general culture can tell new myths about him. But I can guarantee you this, if, and this would be, for me, tragic, if anything ever happened to, to Jackson, it would be a few years. But then, the next thing you know, we would have pictures of him. He would be whiter than when he was alive. This is, I mean, just, just let me, uh, this is for me a humorous note. I noted as the years went on how Martin Luther King got whiter and whiter. After his death, I mean. The pictures of him, and this is actually noticeable, became whiter and whiter. I, I, I saw him speak once when I was young, and, and, and he was an, an African-American man. He was very dark. I mean, he was, well, black. Yeah. And as the, the photographs of him over the years, now the one used by McDonald's, there's just a hint of skin tone around. Well, anyway, this long digression is only to give you one of my heroes of self-creation today, well, someone I really admire, who's engaged in an act of phenomenal, not only self-creation, but re-creation. And, and through a whole bunch of mistakes, as you know, and, and accidents and misfortunes and stupidities, in order to recreate himself again at another, at another level. And for better or worse, uh, you know, my own feeling, uh, looking at it from the outside, because I don't have his subjectivity, but looking at it from the outside, hell, who knows, it might end up being a life worth living twice. The eternal re uh, return threatens, challenges us with the notion to live a life worth living over and over again, not twice. I mean, that's the best example I could find today, and that's a life that might be worth living twice. Thinking about the great majority that, that toil anonymously day in and day out, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine a life living even the first time, not to mention twice. So the eternal uh, return in Nietzsche, the eternal recurrence of everything, is, uh, is supposed to be frightening. And also, it's supposed to be a positive moment in Nietzsche. It is a positive challenge to engage consciously and self-reflectively in something you do anyway, which is in the constant act of rebuilding your persona, yourself. This is not, and Nietzsche is far too complex to believe, that this is the advice to stop wearing masks and be who you really are. Well, you know, if you ch check the, uh, the philology, the philological history of the word persona, you'll see that that's not interesting. And, I, and I'll make a comparison here with David Hume, the British philosopher, the empiricist. When Hume goes in search of the self empirically, and he knows as an empiricist that he has to find the I, the self, the subject, empirically, he has us do an experiment. We are to look for it and find ourselves in this inner space of our mind, where is the I, the self? And Hume performs this experiment in a treatise of human nature, and damn, there isn't one. You don't know what color your self is, what weight it is, and so on. Not your bodily self, but yourself, that thing that continues through all the changes in your body and hair color and weight, height, and so on. And Hume, with the rigor that belongs to his thinking, goes, it's a fiction. There is no self, no I, no substantial individual beneath all the surfaces. We've looked for it. It's not there. It's a, it's a custom, a fiction, a habit. Just habitually, you know, the way we behave with one another. We have driver's licenses and lawyers to take care of continuity. There isn't such a thing. It's a convention, a habit, and so on. Well, for, so, so that people wear masks is not only interesting, it's interesting because beneath the masks there isn't something called the self. So that makes one become concerned in Nietzsche's way that the various masks, shapes, and forms that one does wear and choose in order to become what one is, to use Nietzsche's phrase, in order to become what one is, 
is not to become an authentic self, but to become the best and most interesting self that you can create. And it's not a, in that sense, it does not belong to the dogmatic tradition of philosophy, because God knows what variety of selves would be created if people had the opportunity and the vision and the will and imagination to create themselves in this radically self-conscious way that Nietzsche challenges us to do in his myth of the eternal return.